Man, you know when you hear a song for the very first time and it just captivates you? And you realize when you hear it, I love this song. I remember the first time on MTV I saw the video of Nirvana Smells Like Teen Spirit. Man, I remember thinking, I don't know what this is, but I love it. I don't know what it's making me feel like on the inside, but I love this feeling. I don't just listen to music, I feel music. And so, man, I was just captivated. I loved it. And so you become a big fan, a fan of the song, a fan of the artist, a fan of the singer, a fan of the band. And so they start to take off because they have this one hit, and it's top 40, and they just have all this success. And so you, you become a fan, whether it's when you were a kid, you heard the song, whether it's when you were in grade school or college or maybe just a few years ago. But let's say that this band, they took their big hit, and they took their hit out on the road, and they just became super popular, a lot of popularity, a lot of fame. And let's say that the hit was something like the Macarena. Anyone remember that song, the Macarena? Or maybe you fell in love with, hey, Mickey, you're so fine, or Rico Suave. I don't know why anyone would fall in love with that song, amen. Or Achy Breaky Heart. Y'all remember that song? Remember those line dances? Y'all know y'all did them, line dances, Achy Breaky Heart. Y'all got the mullets, too, all that kind of stuff, or... My Sharona, or who was it really that let all them goofy dogs out? Remember all that kind of stuff? But anyway, they have this hit. They take their hit out on the road. The crowds are big. The stadiums are big. The concerts are big. Everything's taken off. And so then they put out their second album, but there's no top 40 hit on it. And so they go back out on the road to do a tour. The crowds get a little bit smaller, but they're still kind of popular because of that one hit. And then they put out their third album, but there's no top 40 hit on it. They go back out on the road to promote that album. The crowds get a little bit smaller, but they're still pretty good. Then the next few years kind of come along, and they just kind of fizzle away. And then years and, and years and years later, you see on social media or you see a billboard that this is about to happen, and you get really excited. Throw up that picture on the screen. The I Love the 90s Tour. Man, Vanilla Ice is making a comeback. He's going on the road with Coolio and Color Me Bad. And all the boomers say, I know who they are. And all the millennials say, I have no idea who Color Me Bad is. Don't look up Color Me Bad. There's no reason to look them up. Amen. But they had that one hit wonder and all that kind of good stuff. And so they all go out on tour together. By the way, here's the difference between what a monster band is and a one hit wonder. If you were to get on your phones or tablets today and get into your search engine, and if you were to type in, a few years ago I took my father in law and my dad to see the outlaw, Merle Haggard at the Golden Nugget. Man, it was awesome. But if you type in Merle Haggard at the Golden Nugget, this is the picture that comes up on the screen Merle Haggard at the Golden Nugget. I was there, that was him. I saw that. It was awesome. But if you get on that same search engine and you type in Vanilla Ice at the Golden Nugget, throw up the next picture. This is what comes up. Man, a bunch of dessert. <laughs> Listen, you, you type in Merle Haggard, and the only thing that comes up, Merle Haggard, is Merle Haggard at the Gold Nugget. But you type in Vanilla Ice at the Gold Nugget, you got ice cream, you got cake, you got drinks, all kind of stuff. The only thing you don't get is Vanilla Ice himself, and that's the difference between a monster band with longevity and a one-hit wonder. But they all go out on tour together, all these one-hit wonder bands, because they don't have enough songs on their own to make a full concert. And so this is what happens. Notice this on the screen this morning. You're still with me, Sam, so still with you. They all go out on tour together so they can try to cash in again on their old past success because most of them believe that they cannot do it again. They try to go back out and ride the wave of the past to recreate the wave of the past and the momentum of the past. And a lot of times churches can be the same way. It's like we try to hold on to the old programs, the old methods, the old beliefs, the old opinions, the old interpretations, the old ways hoping that somehow we can reclaim the old success, the old momentum, the old revival feeling, the old church feeling, the old atmosphere feeling. We can reclaim all these things instead of standing up and doing something new right now today for the future, doing something fresh right now today for the future, doing something creative and unique right now today for the future so we can move forward and reach people that God's called us to reach. And think about this this morning and notice this on the screen. There are new ways to do in church that we haven't even thought of yet. And that's really the one thing that keeps me awake at night, if I could be honest with you. There are ways of doing church that no one has even thought of yet. And I always run into people and say, well, Tony, God gave us the blueprint and the example of how to do church in the Bible. Well, this is how they did New Testament church in the Bible. They didn't have buildings like this. They didn't have media. They didn't have lights. They didn't have drums. They didn't have electric guitars. They didn't have amazing vocalists and all that kind of good stuff. This is how they worshiped in the book of Acts because they didn't have any of those things. They just cooked these awesome meals. I mean, buttermilk biscuits from Popeye's, chicken sandwiches, listen, chicken breast, listen, uh, dirty rice, taters and gravy, make your tongue slap your face, dip the buttermilk biscuit in it, amen. 
And then they would do that, and as they were eating, they would just share stories about Jesus. This is what we saw him do. This is what we heard him say. This is the miracle we saw him perform. This is what we heard him teach. And over and over again, it was called oral tradition. They would just pass down story after story after story about Jesus. In fact, the Apostle John says there's so many stories about Jesus that if we could put them all down on paper, the whole world couldn't contain the books that should be written. And that was just in three years of his life. Could you imagine? Jesus? Listen, we don't know half of what Jesus did. The Bible that we have and the life of Jesus we read about isn't half of what he did. John says, if we wrote down everything, there wouldn't be enough books in the world to contain all the amazing things that Jesus Christ did. And this is the God that we love and this is the God that we serve. Amen. And there's ways to do in church that we haven't even thought of yet. And this is what keeps me awake at night. I've been preaching for over 20 years. I've preached in a ton of churches, big, medium, and small, and without a doubt, one of the greatest enemies of a church seeing God doing amazing things, one of the greatest barriers that will always hold a church back and stop the work of God in that church, and that church from going forward is this. Notice this this morning. You're still with me, Sam, still with you. Go back to the other one. Traditionalism. Now, there's nothing wrong with tradition. I love a good tradition. We all have traditions at Christmas time, anything like that, but traditionalism is different. Traditionalism is holding on to a tradition with the intent to resist change because we've never done it like that before. And everyone look right here. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people in church say, we don't want to do that because we've never done it like that before. It's very ironic to me that the very people who say Jesus has changed my life resist change so much in the church. That doesn't make sense to me at all. Amen. I mean, listen, the... The church is filled with people who says, man, I was a drunk, but Jesus changed me. Man, I was an addict, but Jesus changed me. Man, I was down in the dumps, but Jesus rescued. Jesus changed my entire life. And then you take those very same people, and you try to make a small change in church, you think someone shot their mama. And you just finished sharing a testimony about how much you love change, how Jesus changed your life. But you don't want us to do something different new in the church. One of the greatest enemies to church growth and to church seeing God doing great things is people holding on to traditions just for the sake to resist change because we've never done it like that before. Amen. Traditionalism can kill the church. And one natural path that most churches go down is this. We've never done it like that before. Several years ago, I was pastoring a church that had a lot of potential. A lot of potential, a lot of young couples, a lot of people, a lot of great talent. But they also had a lot of tradition, and they had a lot of problems. And as I was pastoring that church, it was the church that I was pastoring right before I started The Water's Edge. I was only there for a little over two years. As I was pastoring that church, I really began to have this burden that the church was just going through the motions, the church in general, especially the church that I was at. We were just going through the motions. We were just being religious. We were having Sunday services, but we weren't really reaching people that didn't go to church. The only thing we were seeing was people leaving their churches because they liked our church and people left our church because they liked that church. And we were just kind of swapping sheep. But we weren't reaching people that were hurting and hungry and suffering and needed God and needed help. And that really concerned me because the church exists for people who weren't here yet. Amen. And so I read this book that just wrecked me. The book was called No Perfect People Allowed by John Burke. If you ever want to read a great book, read that book, No Perfect People Allowed. And, man, it really was just an awesome book, and it really changed my view of ministry. And the main idea of the book was this. Don't start with your beliefs about people or your beliefs about who they should or should not be. Don't start there. Just start with the individual person. Because for years and years through the history of the church, we don't start with people. We start with what we believe about what people do, and then we put them in that category. Oh, you've done this? We're going to put you in that category. Oh, you've been through that? We're going to put you in that category. And we deal with people by what they've done and what they've been through instead of just dealing with them as an individual real person. And so this book was all about treating each person differently on a case-by-case basis, getting into their situation, descending into the particulars of their story, and figuring out how to alleviate the pain that they're going through. And the book was also about how to create a come-as-you-are culture in the church. But the book basically said this, don't start there. Don't just start with what you think the Bible says about divorced people or what you think the Bible says about addicted people or what you think the Bible says about people who are hungry or people who are living in poverty or people who are struggling with something painful in life. Don't start with what you think about what they're going through. Just start with people who are hurting because of what they're going through. Amen? Just start with people. And the book also said how to create, also taught how to create a come as you are culture so everyone, everyone feels welcome in the church. And so, man, I took that book and I presented it to our staff. Our staff went through it. The staff loved it. We had a great staff at that church. And then I took our small group leaders through that book. And every person loved it except for two men in that group. 
two men out of 500 people decided we're not going to let this happen in our church. We don't want to be a come as you are church. We don't want to try anything new. We don't want to try anything different. We've never done it like that before. And so we're going to resist this with everything that we have. And that's what they did. I got dirty emails. I got dirty phone calls. They went back to their people. They gathered up about 20 or 30 people out of 500 people. And you and I all know that 20 or 30 people out of 500, if they're loud, can cause a lot of problems. A lot of problems. Let me tell you about some of the things they had problems with. This was back in 2004. I don't know if you remember back then, but gas prices were over $3 a gallon. It was awful. And people were really struggling. So I came up with the idea. I said, man, let's go to all the local gas stations in this little town, and let's buy $15 gas gift cards. And then next Saturday, let's take all these gift cards, and as people are filling up with gas, let's walk up to them and say, here, here's $15 of free gas just to help you out because we know it's costing a lot to fill up th th these days with gas. And, we're just, and when people ask us, why are y'all doing this, all we're going to say is we love you, God loves you, we're just from the church down the road, there's nothing up our sleeve, no strings attached, we just want to help you out. You would have thought I shot somebody's dog. <laughs> Tony, you're trying to pay people to come to church? You're trying to use some gimmick? To get people into the doors. I mean, we don't, all we need is Pentecostal worship and hot preaching. Man, it worked before. It worked in the 1980s. It can work today. Listen, if the 1980s come back, most churches will be ready. Newsflash, they ain't coming back. Amen. But that's all they wanted to do. If, if, if it worked in the 80s, it should work today. Pentecostal worship and hot fire preaching. We don't need all those gimmicks. One Sunday morning, we had a big friend day. I told the church, I said, invite all your friends. And on that Sunday, we're going to give away a free cruise. So we had this big bucket. When people walked in that Sunday, they could put their name in the bucket. And at the end of the service, we drew one name, and we gave it a free cruise to a family whose house burnt down the week before. <laughs> These two men acted like I crucified Jesus all over again. What a gimmick. Just trying to grow the number, just trying to... Get people in the doors when all we were trying to do is just to love on people because the people that were coming had mohawks and the real issue was we don't want our kids sitting next to those kids. We don't want a homeless person who may not smell good to sit next to us in church. We don't want a kid who just had a binge the night before whose parents are just MIA. We don't want that kid who smells like liquor and drugs to come sit next to our kids. We don't want that. And so they resisted it at every turn. And they were loud enough to where they caused our staff to leave one by one. The first staff to leave was our children's minister. He was awesome. After that, we started losing other staff members. At the end of the day, the only people that were left was myself and my little brother, Ryan. And that's when God used that situation to say, go home to Lake Charles and start a church, release that vision, and do something new. Amen. And do something fresh. And that's why we're here. And that's when I knew that I will never be a part of a church that puts their traditions before people. And I will never lead a church or be a part of a church that puts their views and their opinions about what people have done or been through before those very people. Amen. And let me tell you something else. I'll never be a part of a church that stifles the work of God just because we've never done it like that before. Amen. I'll never do that. Listen, I've seen too many churches miss out just because they believe this. We've never done it like that before. Hey, at the water's edge, I want you to know something. You're never going to know what to expect. Amen. Amen. It's going to be different. It's going to be fresh. It's going to be new all the time. The one thing it will always be is holy and godly, but it will be creative and new and fresh. Amen. We're going to march, and we're going to keep marching, and we're not going to get stuck in our bubble. Amen. Right. That's how I grew up. I grew up in our Baptist bubble. Leave us alone. Get us away. Get away from us, you dirty, nasty world. Let me die here. <laughs> Don't touch me, perverts, <laughs> evil liberal people. Just get away from me. Get away. You know, all the categories we got for the people we don't like. Just leave me alone. Get away. And I'll never be a part of a church that stays in the bubble. We're going to be preoccupied with people who are hurting or outside these walls. Amen. And if I could just share my heart with you this morning, I love God's church. People find support here when they need it. People find love here when they need it. People find hope, inspiration, life change, and God here when they need it. And I deeply care about the future of the church, which means I also have to deeply care about what people outside of the church say, think, and feel about the church. We can't just be concerned with what people inside the church think about the church. See, almost everyone's going to leave here today and say, man, that was awesome. 
It was only about an hour. We get to get out and get lunch before the Pentecostals get out. It was really cool. The band was cool. Pastor Tony got to the point. That was, that was really awesome. But you're here today, and this ain't about us. There's a few empty seats around you, and it's about those empty seats. Amen? Because those are hurting people who aren't here yet. Those are addicted people. Who aren't, those are rejected people. Those are broken people who aren't here yet. Amen? And we should be preoccupied with those people. Um, I got invited to speak at a Christmas party last night for one of the local urgent cares in town because, check this out, none of these people come to our church. But the main doctor who didn't come to our church either, he heard about what we did for the homeless and sheltering, all that kind of stuff, and he gave his employees at Lake Charles Urgent Care a choice. He said, I can give you all all Christmas bonuses, and at our Christmas party, we can do the regular traditional gift exchange or no Christmas bonuses this year, no gift exchange, and we can give donations to the Water's Edge Food Pantry. What do y'all want to do? And every employee said, we want to give donations to the Water's Edge Homeless Ministry and Food Pantry. So, so last night, I go to Panorama to go to this party, my wife and I, and I speak at it and all kind of stuff. And one by one, after I speak, people at this Christmas party came and said, we don't go to Water's Edge. We don't go to any church. We quit going to church in our teens. We were Catholic. We were Baptist. We, it just doesn't really relate to us. But... We've heard about y'all. We've heard about what y'all do. We've seen what y'all do for people, for people who are struggling. And when we do decide to go to church, that'll be the first one that we try. Now, that's what people think about you. That's not what most people are saying about other churches in our world. If you were to ask people outside of the church what they think about people in the church, they would say judgmental, exclusive, condemning, Hateful, harsh, elite. They think they're better than everyone. They look down, always preaching to everybody. They don't say that about us, amen? Because we don't just believe in being good. We believe in doing good. So because of all that this morning, very quickly, I just want to share some of our values with you this morning. Number one, because we want to be a church that marches forward, we, we value on the screen creativity. Our service topics will be creative. Our song selections will be creative. Our offerings will be creative. Our food pantry is going to be creative. Our ministry is going to be creative. And let me tell you why. Because God is the creator, and the very spirit of God that hovered over the creation in the beginning lives on the inside of us right now. And so the church, God's church, should be the most freaky, creative place in the world. We should be more creative than Hollywood. Hollywood doesn't have the spirit of God, and we do. Amen? And Luke chapter 5, there's a man who's paralyzed, and he can't get to Jesus, but he needs to get to Jesus because he heard the stories about Jesus, and if anyone can help me, it's Jesus. But I can't walk. I'm sick. I'm crippled. I'm paralyzed. I can't get to Jesus, but I have some friends. I'm going to ask them, will you bring me to Jesus? So four friends decide they're going to bring their paralyzed friend to Jesus. They lay him down on a pallet, and each one picks up a corner of the pallet, and they all start walking together to get this man to Jesus. Jesus was in a house. This house was packed. He was preaching hot and heavy. People were hanging out the windows. People were standing outside. They just wanted to pack the house. They wanted to hear Jesus preach. They were having church. At the same time, down the road, you have four friends that are all walking together. You didn't have one friend pick up this corner of the pallet and walk that way, and this friend pick up that corner of the pallet and walk that way. They wouldn't have gotten anywhere. They all had to walk together in the same direction with unity, which is why we're here today, to come together, not to be divided, to come together, to do something good, not just to be good, but to do something good for people who hurting and so they bring this man to the house and when they get to the house it's so packed because Jesus is there and when Jesus is there people show up and so people are listening and they see this paralyzed man and his friends trying to get him to the door but the Bible says there were so many people they couldn't get him through the front door because the people wouldn't let him in the equivalent would be man we're having church leave us alone we don't want to break up our Bible study right now for homeless people go away we're having Bible study leave us alone Now, the traditional way to get into a house is to go through the front door. They couldn't go through the old way, the traditional way, so they tried the window. So many people, they couldn't get through the window. They're desperate, and so then they get creative to get this man to Jesus because the traditional way wasn't working, and the old way wasn't working. What worked in 1980 isn't working right now, so they tried to figure something out. So the next thing you know, man, Jesus is preaching. He doesn't know what's going on, and as he's preaching, parts of the roof start hitting him on the head. The next thing you know, these four friends had gotten a rope. They tied it to the pallet, and they're letting this man down from the roof right in front of Jesus. Could y'all imagine if the roof opened up right now and people started letting people down saying, Pastor Tony, they need help. They they couldn't get through the door. 
So Jesus is preaching. The roof is falling in. They let him apparently. Jesus heals that man right there. Now, if that's not creative, I don't know what is. Amen. <laughs> hey, the old doors, the old ways, that's not working. Sometimes a church just has to get on the roof and do something different. Amen. And being creative for the church is not a gimmick. It's a necessary value. And it's necessary work. Because sometimes people don't get to Jesus unless we get on the roof. Amen. Number two on the screen is this. You're still with me. I'm still with you. We value discipleship. We don't want to just develop people who attend a weekly worship service. We want to teach people how to live the Bible, which is why when you leave here, you tell me, Tony, that's going to help me tomorrow. Tony, what we hear at church helps me live our life during the week. It feels like you're speaking straight to me because I don't just want to stand up on Sundays and say, hey, y'all, let's open up to Exodus this morning. I don't know. Let's start in chapter 4, and, man, we're just going to go start in verse 1, and wherever we decide to finish today, we're just going to go line by line through the Bible. I'm going to teach you the Bible today, and next week we'll just start where we left off you ain't nobody come back amen the only people that would come back are the people who've been committed to church their entire life and they hate it anyway they just make themselves go we don't want to just teach you the bible we want to teach people how to live the bible which includes how to love properly how to forgive properly how to worship properly how to pray properly how to serve properly how to love properly and how to walk with god properly discipleship leads to peace and we want people to have peace, the peace of God. Amen. Number three, this is where it kind of gets hairy. We'll take some of that and put it on my head. Amen. And anyway, number three on the screen, we value being inclusive. What I mean by that is this. When we say that everyone is welcome at the water's edge, there is nothing else but that. That is what we mean. Everyone. Everyone is welcome at the water's edge. And we don't exclude. And I'll tell you why. Because we know that the most effective way for people to find faith in God is in community. The most effective way for people to find faith in God is not to go to a revival. It's not to go to a tent meeting and you have to walk down the saw dress trail and have a pastor lay hands on you. And then, uh, it, It's not someone giving you a gospel track at, the, at contraband days or someone walking to you at Walmart and say, hey, if you died today, where would you go? I don't know. I want to go to heaven. Say this prayer. That's not the best way to bring people to faith. People walk away from that eventually. The best way to bring people to faith is with no judgment and no strings attached. Let them belong before they believe without making them feel judged. Make them feel welcomed and they'll find faith. Amen. I grew up in church my whole life. I could not miss church unless my eyes were bleeding or I was about to have chemotherapy or something. like. I had to go to church. I tell everyone, everybody, I grew up with a drug problem. I was drugged to Sunday morning Sunday school, Sunday morning church, Sunday night church, Wednesday night church. I was drugged to church. I had to go to church. And it took me 10 years to find faith in God from nine years old to 19, being in church three, sometimes four times a week. It took me 10 years to wrestle with it. How much more will someone walk off the streets who hadn't been to church in years, doesn't know, how much longer do you think it's going to take them to wrestle with this? Is God real? Does God love me? Can God change me? Am I going to fail? Am I going to fail God? Am I going to make a, a, an embarrass myself? And can I really do this? What is God? Listen, people have all these things to work through, and the best way to help them work through it is to say, welcome. You don't have to have any of that figured out. You don't have to have any of that settled before you can come here and belong here. In fact, I have friends that come to this church who don't even believe in Jesus. You know why they come here? They don't believe in Jesus yet. They, 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 you, but you know why they come This is what they say. They say, I'm not sure about all that, but I see the good that y'all do, and I believe in that. I believe in that. So that's why we welcome people. Number four on the screen is this, and we're marching. If you're still with me, I'm still with you. We value worship, and what I don't mean is we value singing songs for 25 minutes. I mean we value coming together in a weekly, beautiful gathering like this so we can sing together and pray together and serve together and laugh together and hug each other and encourage each other and lift each other up and give together and do good together. And when we come together in a weekly worship, beautiful gathering like this, and we all do this together, we all grab those corners of the palette, and we all march together in unity no division with love for people and love for God, then people find hope here. People find freedom here. People find forgiveness here. People find inspiration here. And people find God here. Amen. And that's what worship is about. Number four on the screen is this. We value people. 
Now, during the medieval times, life had changed drastically from the time that Jesus was here, just in that short amount of time. So in the time Jesus was here, and after that, up until the Middle Ages, the way church leaders would guide culture and try to help people is they would simply point people to what the Bible says. Oh, you're going through this? This is what the Bible says. Oh, you've done that? This is what the Bible says. Oh, this is who you are? This is what the Bible says about you. So they would point people to these broad, general... I got a burp. Hold on. (laughs) Sorry. Man, I ain't going to charge you for that one. I mean, that was extra. Anyway, they, they would point people to these broad general beliefs and these broad general statements and say, this is what we believe about these types of people and these types of people. But the Jesuits figured out that people's problems were so deep and so complex that they had to figure out a better way to love people and help people find God. And that was this. If you're ready for it, say I'm ready. They started to practice a method of dealing with people situationally. Case-by-case basis, this is what the Jesuits would do. They wouldn't say, oh, you've been through a divorce. We know other people have been through a divorce. This is what the Bible says about that. No, they understood that if you've been through that, your story isn't the same as their story. What you went through is not what they went through. I can't put you in that category. I have to deal with you as an individual person. I have to descend into the particulars of your heart and story so I can figure out how to love you and alleviate your pain. But through the years since then... The church has reverted back to the old way, back to treating people and their battles with these broad general statements and these broad general beliefs and these broad general opinions. And we do this by looking at people through the filter of how we think they should be instead of just a person who's real, who has a real soul and a real past and real hopes and real dreams and real failures and real stories and real heartache and real pain. We treat people with these broad general statements and categories instead of just dealing with the individual. The church is people. The church loves all people. The church is trying to help and reach people, so we must start with people. But this is what the church has done in the past to our detriment. Oh, you've been divorced. Well, this is what the Bible says about being divorced. This is what we believe about being divorced. We're going to place you over here. Oh, you're addicted. Well, this is what the Bible says about being addicted. This is what we think about being addicted. So we're going to place you in this category. Oh, you have this financial ruin in your life. Oh, you're homeless. Well, this is what we believe about that. This is what the Bible says about that. And so this is the category that we're going to place. Oh, you live different than me. You vote different than me. You think different than me. Well, this is what the Bible says about that. And this is what we believe about that. And so we're going to put you in that category. And so we've treated people not as... People, we've treated people like they're an issue. People are not an issue. People are real. People have real hearts, real hurts, real pain, real faith. They're not an issue. They're not a category. They're not a label. They're a real person and they need to be loved. Amen. And they have a story. They have a story. And so, this is not the Jesus way just to treat people with these broad general statements. I want you to notice what Jesus did very quickly in the book of Matthew. You're still with me, Sam, still with you. When Jesus returned to Capernaum, a Roman officer or a Roman official came and pleaded with him. Now, back then, a Roman officer was called a centurion. And back then, the Roman centurions were literally the hands and feet visual example of Roman oppression against the world. These people were the best of the best, the strongest warriors. And so they literally oppressed Jewish people and Jesus. It was unheard of for a Roman to approach a Jewish rabbi and ask Jesus for help or ask a rabbi for help. But Jesus didn't start with who this man was. And the category that his religion had placed this man in, Jesus just started with this man as an individual. This is what he says, Lord, my young servant lies in bed paralyzed. He's in terrible pain. Jesus said, I will come and heal him. But the officer said, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come into my house. The reason why he said that is because he knew who he was and he knew who Jesus was. So you just say the word from where you are and my servant will be healed. I know this because I'm under the authority of my superior officers and I have authority over my soldiers. I only need to say go and they go. Or come, and they come. If I say to my slaves, do this, they do it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed. Turning to those who were following him, he said, I tell you the truth, I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. Now, the reason why Jesus said he hadn't seen a faith like this is because this Roman officer confessed, Jesus, I believe you have authority over everything, even over death. In fact, I believe that you have so much authority, you don't even have to come to my house. You just say the word from where you are, and I know he's going to be healed. And Jesus said, I've never seen faith like that. But think about the way Jesus responded to this Roman officer right here. He listened very closely to his story. He descended into the particulars of his heart, and then he figured out what was hurting him and how to alleviate that pain. Notice what he did not do. He didn't start by saying, are you Jewish? Have you been circumcised? 
Do you believe in God? You do understand that what you've done right now by approaching me is unholy. And you do understand that if you really want God, you must defy your immoral government, by the way. Jesus didn't start there at all. Jesus listened to his story. He listened to his heart. He descended into the particulars of that story. He figured out the pain that was causing this man heartache, and he alleviated that suffering and that pain. The focus of Jesus was entirely on this man and this man alone. Jesus never did anything the same twice. And when I tell you that he treated each person as an individual, we see this example over and over again. Sometimes Jesus would meet a blind person who needed to be healed, and Jesus would say, you're healed. And then the very next time he meets a blind person who needs to be healed, and Jesus spits in the dirt, picks it up with his hand, makes mud, wipes it on the guy's eyes, and says, now go to the water and wash it off, and then you can see. Because he dealt with each person differently as an individual. He didn't have these broad beliefs and these broad categories that he placed people in. And let me tell you something. If we would do that as a church, it would change the church radically. Amen? Radically. The future of the church, our church, will always be about people first. People first. And thank God for that. Amen? So notice this on the screen. Jesus started with his heart and his story, not some broad category that religion placed this man in. And that's what we want to do. We don't want to start with, oh, you're divorced. We just want to start with, what's your name? What's your story? How are you hurting? Oh, you've just got out of rehab. You just got out of jail. Oh, your family's breaking apart. You're filing for bankruptcy. We don't want to start there. We want to start with, who are you? What's hurting you? What's going on? What's your story? And how can we help? Amen. And so this morning is Future Sunday. And today we take up our end of the year vision offering. And this year it goes to the food pantry, like I told you earlier. 100% of what you gave today is going to be given away to the food pantry. Why? Because we believe in the church. We believe in the future. We believe in loving people. And we believe in putting people first. Because notice this this morning. Still with me, I'm still with you. Children of God are invited not to simply be good, but to also do good for others. Let me tell you what happens to churches who only focus on being good. Stop doing that. Stop saying that. Stop drinking that. Stop snorting that. Stop sleeping with that. Whatever. You know what I'm saying? You got to be good. You got to be holy. And so what happens is that that becomes your main focus. Be careful what you watch. Be careful what you listen to. Be careful where you go. Be careful how you live. If that's your main focus, then this is what happens. You'll be having a Bible study one Sunday night. A homeless person will show up and you'll say, I can't help you because we're having Bible study. We're trying to be good. But there's another step you got to do good. Amen. And that's why we're taking up this offering today. So we don't just focus on being good, but we focus on doing good for people who need help. Notice this on the screen. After this interview, the wise men went their way. And the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened up their treasure chest and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, myrrh, When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. The wise men from the east, when they heard that Jesus was born, they made their way to Jesus. When they found Jesus, they opened up their treasure chest, and they gave gifts because they loved Jesus. When you love, you give. This morning, we have opened up our treasure chest to give because we love. When God loved the world, what did he do? For God so loved the world that he gave. When you love... Sometimes you have to be generous to make an impact. And so today we open up our treasure chest to help love people and feed people. And also, let me just say this. The wise men, they had to return home a different way. The old way wasn't working. Church sometimes needs to be the same way. The old way's not working. We can't get people through the door. We're going to have to try something else. Everyone look right here. What if we were the ones who built our own emergency homeless shelter? What if we were the ones who did that? By the way, the plans are already being drawn up. Yeah. What if we were the ones who started job training programs? Oh, Tony, the church, you just need to preach the word. People's problems are a lot more complex than just preaching the word at them. A lot more, amen? 
What if we were the ones who did Sunday morning worship in ways we'd never heard of before in this city? What if we were the ones who did youth ministry, kids ministry, pantry ministry, homeless ministry, feeding ministry, media ministry, servanthood ministry in ways this city has never seen or heard of before, amen? The future of the church is bright. We're not going backwards because God's not pulling us backwards. God's pulling us ahead and we're marching forward, amen? As the church, we're the architects, we're the curators, we're the artists of the new. Let's go create something new. And let's make a big impact. Amen. Amen. If you didn't give in the offering earlier, we still have some envelopes when you leave. If you love what we're doing, pray about helping us out. If you need help today because you're going through a tough time, find me at the stage after the service. Next week is our Christmas service. It's going to be big and awesome. We love you. Let me pray for you. Then you can be.